It's been over a year since the U.S. Surgeon General issued a dire warning about the state of young Americans' mental health. To dig deeper into that crisis, William Brangham recently traveled to Oregon, which ranks among the worst states for youth mental illness and access to care. He found a system facing heavy burdens, but one searching for solutions. It's part of our new series, Early Warnings, America's Youth Mental Health Crisis. And we want to let you know in advance, this story includes discussions of suicide and depression. <laughs> it feels like a rec room with string lights and beanbag chairs, and it often sounds like one. I submitted like five of my college applications. <laughs> but what's happening here is a unique approach to helping young people who are in crisis. This is the call center for Youthline in Portland, where teenagers field calls from other teenagers who are struggling. It's still really brave of you to reach out about something so difficult. A group of volunteers staffs the helpline daily. They take calls, texts, and chats, and the issues they hear about run the gamut. It sounds like you've been friends for a long time and you really care about her. They reach out when they're experiencing a crisis. That can mean lots of things. That can be something smaller like relationship struggles or friendship issues, family issues, but it can also mean like more acute crises like self-harm or suicide. Each volunteer gets more than 60 hours of training and master's level supervisors are constantly on standby, in the room, listening in and reading along, ready at a moment's notice to step in if a conversation gets too serious. We're not medical professionals, we're like a sidekick really um, there's like and they're like the person has the option to choose what they want to do they're like the hero of the story we're just there to assist them to make that choice research suggests that teens cope better with stress when they interact with their peers rather than adults so the volunteers listen empathize and if needed help figure out a plan for getting care only in rare cases does youth line need to contact emergency services we just have a much better perspective on what it's like to be a teenager today and the complexities that that comes with and the strain that that can put on your mental health. And the need is clearly growing. Youthline started over 20 years ago, and in 2013, it received roughly 1,400 contacts, many coming from in-state. But by 2021, things had exploded, with almost 25,000 annual contacts from all across the country. But... Is it a good idea to have teens field these calls? And what impact might that be having on the volunteers themselves? Emily Moser is YouthLine's director. Woven into all of the mentoring, all of the training, are these, these safeguards for these young people, that we, uh, we have contact information for their parents, we can reach out to them if they need to. They do check-ins every day after every shift. We underestimate the capacity of what young people can do to help other young people. As adults, it's easy for us to say, mm, they can't do that, but they can. 17-year-old Aditi Khanna has been a Youthline volunteer for about 10 months. Everyone tries to go immediately towards like solving something. Like you can't always solve everyone's issues and just like telling them that you hear them. I think that's like the biggest difference between what we're trying to do and like what anyone else is. Like many who work here, Aditi herself has faced some mental health challenges. She was diagnosed with depression and anxiety in seventh grade. It is so much harder than you would like imagine it to be, right? Cause it's like, it feels like lifting like a thousand pounds, just trying to get up. Huh? The news came as a shock for Aditi's mother, Sangeeta. Love my kids, they get everything. Like, what, what could what they what be? Could, what could the depression be about? Like my heart sank immediately. I said, no. You know the big round Aditi started therapy, tried medication, and saw a drastic improvement. Now, not only does she volunteer with Youthline, she says she can also sense when something seems off with friends or classmates. You think there is a real crisis among young people now? Oh, completely. I think that it is very rare that I meet someone and that they're not struggling with their mental health. A state audit in 2020 found Oregon's youth mental health system left many children and their families in crisis due to, among other issues, severe staff shortages, poor data, and fragmented delivery of care. And that was even before the pandemic exacerbated those issues. 
We had this huge massive influx of families needing services all right now and at the highest need right away. Nick Kintai is a pediatric psychiatric social worker at Randall Children's Hospital in Portland where they saw a surge of young people who had attempted suicide. We're not specifically a psychiatric hospital, but at one point, if I remember right, my, my supervisor told me that our hospital census was 33% psychiatric kids. Wow, a third. A third of our entire hospital at one point was acute psychiatric kids needing a higher level of care, and, and our staff is not equipped to manage that. And, and it's not something you budgeted for the year before? No, or trained. And so you have certain floors with, with highly trained nurses and pediatricians taking care of infants and babies with RSV. And now those nurses are having to take care of a 17-year-old with a suicide attempt that is highly aggressive and angry. 18-year-old Sam Adamson began having suicidal thoughts when he was just 11. I would say there were a rare amount of times where I felt truly happy. The scariest part, he said, was when the idea of suicide became almost second nature. Wondering why I'm having for dinner, oh, I have to work on this, I want to kill myself, uh, I want water. And you just skip over this massive thought when you look back on the fact that you were thinking, I want to kill myself in a very subtle second. That's terrifying. Sam's mom, Jessica, says finding the right care for him was terrifying, too. We were very fortunate to have insurance, to be part of a health system that is very well resourced in mental health resources. And, and frankly, I had a job in healthcare where I knew how to, you know, You knew how to navigate. Right. And even with all of that, you know, when, when you call and you're told that it's six weeks at a minimum, before they can see you. That just seems impossible. Last year, when Sam was a senior, he called his parents from school. He said, I want to go and jump off of the fourth floor. And there is something about hearing your child who at the very moment where he should have the most hope and opportunity wants to stop participating in the world. It was scary. It broke my heart. Sam went to the emergency room and ultimately enrolled in an intensive outpatient treatment program at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center in Portland. It only happens for a certain amount of weeks. You essentially take it like a class and study the content that they gave me and took notes. Uh, These are tools that you use? Yeah, I use it on a daily, daily basis. Is that right? Yeah. Daily basis. I still have the notes upstairs in my backpack that I just flip through. I remember some of the details about what I talked with my therapist, but what I do remember is us going over what strategies to use during certain occasions. If I didn't have those things, I don't think I'd be sitting here today. But the fact is, that makes me a miracle. And miracles don't always happen. That gives me a mix of anger, frustration, and also a bit of fear and a bit of pain. Just knowing that there are people who aren't that lucky. Organizations like Youthline are trying to fill the gaps and help more people get care. They're looking to broaden the diversity of their volunteers and expand nationally. Despite difficult calls and long days, volunteers like Aditi Khanna find the experience invaluable. Even if it's just like that tiny like push or like pull that someone needs off the ledge, and it can be that for one person, then we've done what we need to do. After I'm done with youth lineup, I can go like, yeah, I was able to help one person from committing suicide. That's like all I need for the rest of my life. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Portland, Oregon. A reminder that anyone experiencing a mental health crisis can get help by calling the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. And the NewsHour's own nationwide network of student journalists has also been tackling the issue of teen mental health as part of their award-winning podcast, On Our Minds. Check it out.
teenagers, we're Olympic athletes, we're young inventors, we're musicians, we're activists. We come from so many backgrounds and are the most connected we've ever been. But we have our own set of challenges. Depression, anxiety, and stress are on the rise. Thankfully, we're not in it alone. On Our Minds is a podcast about the teenage experience. Have like a resource and an outlet so that they can better understand themselves. Made by teens for teens. Each season includes two teen hosts and covers topics such as grades, coming out, eating disorders, self-esteem, cultural identity, and all the things we as teenagers face. Student reporters from across the country produce stories. We also talk with psychologists, musicians, authors, and athletes to get advice about mental health and well-being. Hold it in too long, then you know it can become overwhelming. There is a lot on our minds, and talking about it helps. On Our Minds is a project of the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.